35 seconds of logos. All right, if you're going to be technical here, it's 65 seconds of logos. Thank you very much. Also, why are studio logos sins again? Oh, that's right, because your partner had to go through 5.833333 minutes worth of logos during opening night of Dark Knight, right? This was supposed to be the very first logo sin we ever did, but we cut it because we wanted to make videos under five minutes or some shit. Anyway, the origin of this sin is that Chris was a projectionist when this movie came out, and he interlocked two prints through seven projectors on opening night, and he wanted to make sure the sound was good in each auditorium, which meant he had to sit through these logos, all 50 seconds of them, including a silent bat logo, seven goddamn times back on July 18th, 2008 at midnight. And, oh yeah, he ran Mamma Mia that night. Two people showed up. Good for them. So, the real sin here is biting the hand that fed you. So, because of this dumb sin that they always do for every single video, I'm going to give them five sins every time they do this, because a movie telling the audience who made it is not sinful. Sure, I'm glad Ian Holm is here to remind me of that unpopular trilogy of movies that came out more than ten years ago. Saying that Lord of the Rings was an unpopular trilogy of films, that's worth these many sins. <laughs> Jeremy makes a Game of Thrones pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliché. This is a lot of exposition even for a Lord of the Rings movie. Well, yeah. The movie has to show you and the audience why Thorin and his company are going to the Lonely Mountain in the first place. Otherwise, you would need an explanation as to why Bilbo would randomly go on this quest, and when presented with the book as evidence, you would just say the books don't matter. Also, this scene sets up the other plot threads in this trilogy, like the importance of the Arkitstone, the bitter hatred between Thundriel and the Dwarves of the Iron Hills, and how Smaug took over the mountain in the first place, in which that becomes a huge plot point of the final film. But of course, since you've seen this movie, you're going to completely forget this, aren't you? It began as you might expect. If he's writing all this to Frodo, why does he need to do the whole you it know, began in a hole in the ground crap? Because this is literally the start of The Hobbit. You know, the start of that thing that doesn't exist for you, Jeremy. Oh, hey, Frodo. What are you doing in this movie? Not a damn thing. <laughs> God damn it, that made me laugh. And I was trying to not laugh this entire video. <laughs> Aragorn Jr. Not only is Thorin literally the other main character in this entire trilogy, but also Jeremy makes another Paul Crumpture reference, which shouldn't count towards this film set in the same series. Dwarf doors are invisible. Yeah, except when a huge dragon wants to come in. Oh, come the hell on. How else are any other races in Middle Earth supposed to get into Erebor in the first place? Heck, man, in that exposition that you sinned earlier and are clearly showing here, you can see Thorin and taking the same way to talk to Thor about the gems he is owed. And yes, I'm using the extended edition here because this man doesn't count books, but he does count deleted or extended scenes, so my point still stands. Also, this is literally the first dwarven door that is not hidden. Even if you don't want to count that one from Rings of Power, the only other dwarven door shown in this series is, guess what? The secret door in Erebor. So Jeremy doesn't pay attention to other films. You'd stay out late. Come home after dark, trailing mud and twigs and fly. Gandalf is basing all of his faith in Bilbo on things that all kids do at that age. It's almost like The Hobbit is a kid's book or something. If the dwarves spent as much time training to fight dragons as they did singing, this trilogy would be over by now. Sitting the Misty Mountains cold. That's worth these many sins. Also, this literally is in chapter 1, page 14 of the book. Sure, it's not exactly like it is in the book, but this is still a beautiful retelling of it from the book. Oh, wait. Sorry, I keep forgetting who I'm talking to here. Are the dwarves supposed to have blown out this candle that's still smoking like three seconds ago before leaving, or does Peter Jackson not know how candles work? No, Jeremy. I don't think you know how candles work. The smoke from the candle could clearly stay in one spot for a long period of time before finally dispersing away. 
Besides, the company wasn't very far from Bag End when Bilbo literally ran to catch up to them, so what's the problem? It takes 43 minutes for this film's actual adventure to begin, and the first thing they do is go to sleep and tell more boring dwarf stories. Bullshit. The real sin here is that you just skipped over this part of the film, which literally explains where the rest of Thorin's family went when we saw them all at the beginning of the film, and sets up the main villain, Azog. He's a gentle soul who prefers the company of animals to others. He keeps a watchful eye over the vast forest land. So he's the Unabomber. Actually, Jeremy, you were supposed to say Dr. Doolittle here. Still a better death scene than Miranda Tate's in Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> Fucking god damn it. <laughs> that made me laugh too. Son of a bitch. Even for a kid's movie, this is pretty f***ing ridiculous. First of all, why would a bunch of magical rabbits be too ridiculous for a kid's film? Because normal rabbits can't move sleds? Dude, every December we watch a reindeer that clearly has nose cancer be the lead deer of a magical sled pulled by more magical flying deer that are supposed to help a fat man give presents to children for one night in a year. I think your sense of belief is ridiculous. Also, acknowledges this film as a kid's film, but still fails to see what was the point of Sin 51. These ropes aren't remotely tight or secure. What the hell do you mean they are not secure? The ropes are clearly tight enough to hold 13 dwarves in there, but the trolls also tied their hands together as well. That should have been the real sin here. How come the troll managed to tie up the dwarves' hands? They will outrun you! These are Ruscabel rabbits! I'd like to see them try. On the one hand, this guy just smoked weed, but on the other hand, he knows a lot more about rabbits than I do, so f*** it. Let him go. This one scene alone just perfectly describes what Jeremy has become of late. So yeah, fuck it. Let him go. People will still be happy enough to make fun of you for that later. Radagast immediately forgets his objective is to lead the orcs away from the dwarves and just goes in circle. <laughs> Despite the fact that Jeremy's point was valid, he still did a Betty Hill pop culture reference, which... <laughs> for fuck's sake, this is still funny. <laughs> so I'll give Jeremy three sins instead of the usual five. See, I could be nice. Ish. Bilbo's sword isn't glowing, despite the fact that there are tons of orcs around. And let me stop you right there, because you can see that the sword is indeed blue. But because of the sunlight in that shot, you couldn't see it well. I would make a joke here about Jeremy's eyesight, but I won't go there because that would be too below the belt for me. It's his excessive consumption of mushrooms. Jeez, the guy smokes weed and does shrooms? I think maybe all it takes to be a wizard in Middle Earth is a drug habit and a robe. So we're not just going to talk about the fact that these guys also know how to perform magic? Like, literally the entire point of why they are called wizards in the first place? Otherwise, they would just be a hobo with a drug addiction, Jeremy. Because there is none. Is Sauron supposed to already be evil here, or is he just a dick? Hey, Jeremy, say it with me here. That's called foreshadowing. You know the whole Weathertop scene that you did here? Is this the same spot where Frodo got stabbed in Fellowship? Are you really just cramming in every single possible connection to the other trilogy that you can? So, if they are trying to cram every single connection to the other trilogy, then Saruman being a dick here makes sense. Yeah, this always seems to happen. I start playing Final Fantasy VII, but I end up playing Shadow of the Colossus. First of all, two sins for getting 12 instead of 7. And even though you corrected yourselves in your own sins video, you're still not taking the time to correct this sin for this video. Also, what's wrong with Shadow of the Colossus? It was a well-received game with an interesting, if somewhat sad, backstory. The player literally plays an almost villain-like role. It would be something up your department, Jeremy. So the goblins built this entire collapsible floor just in case somebody came by and wanted to sleep here for a while? Yes. This fall would definitely kill Bilbo if this movie wasn't taking place in a physics-free zone. Oh boy. This might get some people pissed off for me saying this, but... Oh, fuck it. As you said earlier, Jeremy, it's meant to be a kid's film, so of course this movie is going to have moments where it has its main characters become Wily E. Coyote for a few moments in this entire movie. Also, for this particular sin, we all know Bilbo survives this because we saw him in the beginning of the film. He is literally writing his tale down in a book. Not to mention he writes up to the events of Fellowship of the Ring. So yeah, of course Bilbo has to survive this fall. So the real sin here is just... Plot armor. Didn't Gandalf say, The blade is of elvish make, which means to glow blue when orcs or goblins are nearby. And didn't Elrond say that this sword was of elvish make? So then why isn't this blade glowing near all these goblins? Or Gandalf's sword, Glamdring, also made by elves. Alright, here we go. 
Yes, Jeremy, you are correct when Gandalf says that Sting is an elvish sword that glows blue. However, with the Goblin Cleaver and Glambring being made by the same elven blacksmith, it was described in those things you pretend don't exist that only Sting was able to produce the blue glow the most prominently. And if you don't want to go by that explanation, Peter Jackson even admitted he made a mistake by not giving both swords that bluish glow. But since I don't send movies... Rings don't land on fingers like this, unless you're in Middle Earth, where it happens in the first movie of every trilogy. Jeremy makes another pop culture reference, which shouldn't count towards this film set in that same series. See, no physics allowed in Middle Earth. We're supposed to care about this perilous journey that isn't remotely perilous for anyone. And just like I mentioned in Sin 93, this is a kid's film. I get that it doesn't make sense, since it connects to the more realistic Lord of the Rings trilogy, but your disbelief has to already be broken with the rabbits pulling a sled from earlier. Also, as far as I'm aware, Gandalf, Thord, and Balin are down that bridge when it falls. So, they should be fine, considering Thorin doesn't die until the Battle of the Five Armies, Balin has to die before Fellowship, considering his tomb in Moria, and we see Gandalf in the beginning of the Fellowship. So, again, plot armor. Also, also, this they survive this is way more believable than Bilbo's, considering they are just sliding down on a slowly breaking apart bridge, which they land on over the mushrooms Bilbo falls into and somehow survives that. This kill is lucky, but this kill is downright inexcusable. How is that kill inexcusable? Look, I get that hammers are not really seen as often in fantasy films as much as swords and axes are, but a warhammer swung with enough force can possibly crush the skull of their opponent, or in the worst case scenario, knocks them the fuck out. Eagles, again? Is that the only way Tolkien knows how to resolve things? Not always. Sometimes you have an all-powerful wizard use some clever spells to send a literal demon down into a hole, have an entire tree army attack an evil wizard's orc encampment, or have an army of ghosts clear out all the enemies on the battlefield as well as the city they managed to bust down. We'll get to the eagles here in a minute. This rock looks like a bear. What is this, cars? Don't you mean Disney's California Adventure? Cause that was a huge swing and a miss, Jer. This is the single stupidest place the eagles could possibly have dropped off the dwarves, and now they have to make a dangerous climb down a steep f***ing rock. But in a much later shot, you could clearly see that there are stairs taking them down the mountain to continue their quest. Pay attention. Wait, that's the Lonely Mountain? Well, s***. Why didn't the eagles just fly them all the way there? Take them like 15 minutes. I mean, seriously. What do the eagles have to be doing right now that was unimportant enough to stop doing it to come rescue the dwarves, but that they couldn't also spend a few more minutes to fly them all the way to their f***ing destination? And this is the moment I have been waiting for, boys and girls. For those of us who do read the books, we kind of understand why the eagles don't always help the protagonists of both trilogy. For those of you who go with Jeremy's logic of the books don't matter, basically the eagles are like demigods. All they do all day is have giant bird meetings, like these guys. Put yourselves in their shoes. If you're an almost godlike being that just wants to talk to your buddies all day, but you get constantly interrupted by mortals saying that they need your help, you wouldn't want to help these little shits either. They alone help on occasion because Gandalf is an all-powerful wizard and can call them when it's an emergency only. There. Are you guys happy now? Can we all stop bitching about why don't the eagles just solve all their problems now? Bilbo Baggins, hey, scrub the cloth, trim the fat, lay the bones in the bed, you're much 